The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 1. The Making of The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 2. Introduction I began work on Flight of the Amazon Queen 22 years ago, in 1991. It took almost four years for the game to make it to market in 1995. During that time I learned how to build an adventure game, I coded a game engine, wrote scripts, built editors, and designed puzzles. When Amazon Queen finally came out the sense of relief and achievement was tempered with the feeling that I had taken far longer than the folks at Lucasfilm to create a graphic adventure. Amazon Queen was made by three people on a minuscule budget, myself, Steve Stamaciotis and Tony Ball. Looking back on it all, I think we did okay with what we had. Steve helped with design and did all the art in the game. Tony ported the game from the Amiga to the PC, translating my Amos code to C, line by line. We had great support from the wonderful folks at publisher Renegade Eric Matthews, Tom Watson, Abby Haynes, Dan Thompson, and our producer Graham Boxall. They believed in us and gave us the chance to show the world what we could do. The game was also enhanced by the amazing music of the late Richard Joseph and the voice direction of Ben Baird as well as the great cast including Penelope Keith, E.N.N. N. Raytel, Tom Hill, Debbie Arnold, Lisa Valdez and the late Bill Hutkins and Brad Lavelle. In 2013 Mike Bevan of Retro Gamer contacted me about writing a making of Flight of the Amazon Queen article for his magazine. I thought it was a great idea so I rifled through the archive boxes I have stored in my garage in search of any relevant files, books and papers. I found a treasure trove of memories representing four years of my life. Around the same time I was in discussion with GOG.com about releasing Flight of the Amazon Queen on their site. To coincide with the release I thought it would be neat to use the recently unearthed material to develop my own making of booklet. I hope you enjoyed this glimpse into the 22-year journey to bring Flight of the Amazon Queen to your computer. Thanks for playing. John Passfield, September 2013 The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 3. Would you like to make a game? As a kid, I was a computer nerd. I had made games when I was in high school during the 80s and managed to sell two of them a clone of the classic Sega arcade game Pengo that I called Chili Willy, and an original platform shooter inspired by Ghostbusters that I called Halloween Harry. Being an Australian and selling into the local market, fortunes were not made, so I went to university and earned a computer science degree. After graduation I started work at a telecommunications company as a programmer. The work was so mind-numbingly boring that it destroyed my love for computers and I sought solace in writing and drawing comics. It was at the local comic shop run by my good friend John Barry that I was introduced to a comic artist who loved computers. Steve Stamaciotis had an Amiga computer and ambitions to make a game. When he learned about the games I had made in high school he suggested we remake Halloween Harry. I had fallen out of love with computers and resisted the idea but seeing the Amiga reminded me why computers were cool. I bought an Amiga, we started to remake Halloween Harry, I quit my job and our first company, Interactive Binary Illusions, was born. Halloween Harry, released in 1993. Published as Alien Carnage by Apogee. Chili Willy, published 1984 Halloween Harry, published 1985. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 4. Ron Gilbert's Monkey Island While we were busy working on Halloween Harry, my friend John Barry introduced me to yet another thing that would have an impact on my life. This time it was a computer game by Ron Gilbert at Lucasfilm Games called The Secret of Monkey Island. I was a huge fan of text adventures as a kid an encounter with the original Colossal Cave adventure had set me on the path of making computer games. Here was Monkey Island, a game that combined my love of adventure with that of storytelling and comic books. I was mesmerized. When Steve and I played the game we knew we had to make one of our own. Being naive game developers with a game already in production we did what we had to. 
we decided to make an action platform game and a point and click graphic adventure at the same time. Luckily for Steve and I, we met two other local game developers, Robert Crane and Tony Ball, and teamed up with them to take on the programming duties for Halloween Harry. So until 1993 and the release of Halloween Harry, we split our time between the two games. During this time I was keeping a visual diary that I drew and wrote in, it was here that I wrote about the beginnings of the game. Just did some Amazon Queen stuff. Actually, designed the Jasper graphic adventure interface. Works pretty cool. The making of Flight of the Amazon Queen. 5. Coming up with an idea. Steve and I had made our minds up to make our very own graphic adventure now we had to decide what it would be about. We were both huge fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark and felt that an Indiana Jones-inspired game would make the perfect adventure. Ironically, even though The Last Crusade had come out around the same time as Monkey Island, that Indiana Jones adventure game wasn't really a source of inspiration, instead we drew inspiration from the movies. Although it was a fun game, I think we may have unfairly dismissed The Last Crusade as just a movie tie-in. With a genre agreed upon, we needed characters, story, and settings. To differentiate ourselves from indie, we decided to ground our game in a 1950s world inspired by science fiction. Indiana Jones dealt with the occult, so our hero would deal with dinosaurs, robots, and aliens. Little did we know that many years later the Indiana Jones movies would enter the same territory with Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. We also wanted to make a funny game so we created a wisecracking hero, Joe King, pilot for hire and came up with the most ridiculous plot we could a mad scientist and his plan to take over the world with an army of dinosaur women using ancient alien technology. As well as Indiana Jones, we took inspiration from many other sources, Monty Python, classic 50s monster movies, Japanese kaiju films, the Commander Cody serials and films like Star Wars, the Seventh Seal, The African Queen, The Rocketeer, and Amazon Women on the Moon. Before Indiana Jones came across a crystal skull, Joe King was on a quest to find one and save the world. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 6. A Cast of Characters Joe King, pilot for hire the hero of our game is Joe King a pilot for hire inspired by Jake Cutter from the US TV series Tales of the Gold Monkey. Many UK reviews referred to our hero's groanworthy name, Joe King, joking, for those who missed the obvious pun. Sparky Sparky, Joe's best friend and mechanic, was also inspired by Tales of the Gold Monkey. In the TV show Jake's friend was named Corky. For our game we gave him a comic book fixation and used this as a way to introduce the Commander Rocket character that played a role in the final puzzle of how to enter the Valley of the Mists. Faye Russell Faye was inspired by Faye Ray and was an amalgam of the stereotypical Hollywood starlet of the day. Although we resorted to the cliché of rescuing the princess, Azura, we wanted to have Faye rescue Joe. Dr. Frank Ironstein, as you can see in the initial character sketches on the following page, Frank was originally named Einstein. He was also a Nazi. For a long time during production the Nazis were the bad guys, but our publisher Renegade suggested we change them. We renamed them to Flota, a James Bond-like evil agency. Steve had to go back over every Nazi character and redraw them with new blue jumpsuits. The crystal robot slash the most powerful device on the face of the earth Steve loved manga and anime, and there was no way he was going to make a game that didn't feature some sort of giant robot. So we worked one in to the climax of the game where the crystal robot, as the guardian to the Valley of the Mists, grows in size to fight the mutated Dr. Ironstein. Pop culture and real people that we knew inspired many other characters. The gorilla dressed in a costume was inspired by a UK variety show character called Mr. Blobby. We also threw in some Monty Python and Douglas Adams for good measure. The bellboy at the start of the game was based on an electronic arts executive who was incredibly rude to us when we showed him our game. Jimmy and Mary Lou Cook were inspired by TV evangelist Jim Baker and his wife Tammy. 
Big Hugh took his name from Hugh Fleming, our friend and comic book artist responsible for the awesome Star Wars Rocks posters and the Dark Horse Star Wars Episode 1 comic covers. Wedgwood the parrot was based on Steve's own stuffed toy parrot of the same name. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 7. The original cast of characters from left to right Dr. Frank Ironstein, The Crystal Robot, Joe King, Faye Russell, Sparky, Princess Azura, and Trader Bob. The final cast of characters that made it into the game. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 8. Making the Game Our development tools were simple. I had an Amiga 500 computer and used Amos, a basic-like programming language to build the game engine and editors. Steve also had an Amiga and used Deluxe Paint to create the art. Like our tools, our game development process was also simple. We nut out the overall plot of the game, listing out locations, puzzles and characters, sketched those on paper then began to implement them into in the editor. One of the first designs for the opening hotel location. Puzzles changed over time. The making of flight of the Amazon Queen. 9. Engine and Editors I read all I could about how Lucasfilm made their adventure games, but took a different approach to implementing our game engine. While Lucasfilm used a scripting system called SCUM, Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, I chose an editor-based system with drop-down menus. Like Lucasfilm, we also gave our editors and engine silly names too. Jaspa, John and Steve's programmable adventure resource, this was the game engine that the player interacted with. In my mind an adventure game was merely a collection of objects that the player could turn on or off, so I designed the engine and editor around this simple concept. Actors, inventory items and scenery props were all the same, they could either be on screen, or in the player inventory, animating or static. The player could select a verb to use on an object, or use an inventory object on another object the result of which would trigger a limited set of actions if optional game states were true. These actions were very basic and included playing an animation, hiding or showing an object, triggering a cutscene or dialogue, or changing more game states. With these simple set of options, we managed to create an entire graphic adventure. Joker, Jaspa Object Kernel Editor Resource, Joker was where the bulk of the game design was done. This was an editor written in Amos that allowed me to create new objects, layout rooms, and connect them to each other, and set up what would happen when objects and items were clicked on by the player. Dogs, Dialogue Object Generation System, this was a simple editor that allowed me to create a dialogue tree and the bulk of the game's writing was done in this editor. Spams These were special animations that Steve made for actors and props that would play when a puzzle was solved or when a dialogue option was chosen. Joe tying the two sheets together at the start of the game was a spam. Cuts, cut scenes, while basic cut scenes were loaded from simple files containing actor movement positions and text to speak. Other more complicated scenes were hard-coded as functions in the game. It was easier to do this than to extend the editor. Cutscenes could also be trigger from dialogues. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 10. Game States This was my non-sophisticated way to keep track of where the player was in the game. It was literally an array called Game State that was indexed by each number in this list. If game state, 5, was 0 then the piranhas hadn't been feed. When the player used the beef jerky on the piranhas then game state, 5, was set to 1. The making of flight of the Amazon queen. 11. Dialogues. Interactive dialogue trees were a staple of graphic adventures in the 90s, and Ron Gilbert and Tim Schafer were the masters of the form. Before making Amazon Queen my writing was limited to the odd story at school and some simple cartoon strips that I sold to earn money to fund making games, see the About the Author section for more details. Each character had a number of unique dialogues associated with them. The dialogues were fairly simple branching trees of player choices and character responses, 
with options being able to test for game states before being shown and to set game states if selected. Dialogue choices could be removed if selected or set to always display. With this simple system, surprisingly complex dialogue structures could be created. Again, my design philosophy was to try and adhere to the limitations of the system, the player didn't miss what they didn't know couldn't be done. Even though I was the sole user of the editors I made, I took the time to write user manuals for them. Here are some sample pages for your enjoyment. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 12. The top half of this page is an image of what the editor looked like. Each line had a unique ID made of the line number, which could be drilled down into deeper layers. The G and V fields referred to game state and value and could be tested to show hide an option or set if an option was selected. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 13. Cut Scenes here is an example of the hard-coded cutscene procedures for sequences that were too complicated for the simple cuts editor to build. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 14. Locations The game starts out in Buenos Aires before shifting to the Amazon jungle in South America. We chose this location as a nod to the movie The Boys from Brazil in which Nazis raised clones of Hitler as mentioned earlier, the bad guys in Amazon Queen were originally Nazis before we changed them to the international group called Flota. The game was broken down into distinct groups of locations. Hotel This was originally made as a demo level and each room ID begins with a D. We integrated the demo as the start of the game after Renegade suggested we begin here to introduce the characters and extend the gameplay. Crash Site There was where the game originally began after an animated sequence showing Joe's airplane, the Amazon Queen, crash in the jungle. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 15. Locations Trader Bob's This location had the first widescreen room in the game. Amazon Fortress This is where Joe is tasked with rescuing Princess Azra from the clutches of Flota. The Jungle Joe explores the jungle before finding the secret entrance to the Amazon Fortress. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 16. Locations Flota Base There are still trappings of the original Nazi influence in these locations. Set below a Lederhosen factory, the Flota base is modeled in reds and blacks. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 17. Locations Ancient Temple One of the biggest locations, these rooms and puzzles were the most fun to design. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 18. Locations Valley of the Mists The final location in the game is only accessible by a jetpack. Escape. After defeating Frank, Joe, and Azra escape in an airship and they finally kiss. The end is the sun sets we see Frank reappear, still alive, perhaps waiting for a sequel? The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen. 19. Designing Rooms. I would work with Steve to create mock-ups of each location, marking out the exits the player could click on to move to the next or previous location. While Steve was busy working on the background, prop and actor art for each location, I would mock up rooms in deluxe paint to block out the locations. These rooms would be simple flat color shapes to show the floor, walls, and where doors would be. The first step was to link each set of rooms to demonstrate the flow of the game. We called each location a room regardless of whether it was a room, the back of moving truck, a jungle river, or a close-up of an important item. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 20. Building Rooms When Steve had built the art for the room, he would provide the background image of the location as well as the individual sprites for foreground objects, puzzle objects, and any animating objects that would provide life to that location. In the Trader Bob location shown here the front of the counter was a sprite so Trader Bob could stand behind it. We also had a barrel placed in the foreground so Joe could walk behind it. 
Each of these props was sorted on a Y hot spot, so the player could walk in front of behind depending if Joe's foot hot spot was higher or lower than the prop hot spot. After placing each of the props, the action fields from the drop down menus would be set. For example, the record could be picked up only if a certain game state was true, then the record prop was hidden and the record item was made visible and appeared in the player's inventory. The making of flight of the Amazon Queen. 21. Walk Paths To calculate the walk path for Joe, I simply placed a number of rectangles on the room screens to match the pathways that Steve had drawn. When the player clicked on the room, I would pick the nearest rectangle to the mouse pointer and calculate the shortest path from that rectangle to the one where Joe was standing. I added a scale factor to each rectangle to shrink Joe based on his Y position to simulate him walking off into the distance. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 22. Joe King Walk Cycles Steve drew and redraw Joe's animations many times during the project. Joe's original cap had a New York Yankees logo that had to be removed for copyright reasons, it was distinguishable enough to be an issue. We only animated Joe walking to the right and flipped his animations him when he walked to the left. This was made possible by his symmetrical design. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 23. Frank's Walk Cycles For Frank Ironstein, we animated both a left and right walk cycle because he walked with a cane. For the climactic battle against the crystal robot, we only needed one walk cycle. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 24. Special Animations there were over 120 special animation sequences in the game, which we lovingly referred to as spams. Depending on the situation, we would load these up and play them back when a cutscene, dialogue, or a player action triggered them. Here are the special animation sprites for Joe tying the two sheets together and for attaching the sheet rope to the radiator to escape the locked room in the hotel. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 25. Variant Special Animations The special animation of Joe using the sheet rope had to be done three times. This is because Once Joe escapes he can change into Lola's dress to sneak past the guards, and he can also be wearing his boxer shorts if the guards catch him. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 26. User Interface most early graphic adventures used the verb interface with a list of selectable words on the bottom of the screen that the player clicked on before clicking on an object on the screen or an inventory item. Standard verbs included open, close, push, pull, give, talk to, pick up, look at, he use. For Amazon Queen we settled on open, close, move, give, talk, get, look and use. We combined push and pull into one verb move. These screens show different variations of button icons used to represent each verb. This is the final interface layout that we settled on. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 27. Inventory Items We created a total of 95 different inventory items, some of which were the same item in different states such as the baseball bat with gum and the sheets combined to form a sheet rope. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 28. Amiga and PC As mentioned earlier, Steve redid the graphics for the PC version to give the game a richer color palette. Here is an example of the differences. Don't ask me why there is a clown in the lineup. Steve sometimes had the habit of creating new characters on the fly, and this guy didn't make the cut. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 29. Finding a Publisher Flight of the Amazon Queen was published by Renegade in the UK, Europe and Australia and Warner Interactive in the US. However, before we signed with Renegade we had a minor detour with Electronic Arts. The publisher had a sales office on the Gold Coast in Australia, and when we first began making Amazon Queen we began to look for someone who would be able to publish it.
We arranged to visit Electronic Arts to see if they would be interested. They showed interest in the game and were kind enough to lend us a PC so we could begin converting the game from the Amiga to DOS. Being young and naive we didn't ask for an agreement and spent the next few months making the game and reporting back to them on the progress, thinking they'd publish it when it was finished. One day they informed us that their US boss, a senior vice president of Electronic Arts, would be visiting and that we should come down and show him our game. We had playable builds for both Amazon Queen and Halloween Harry so we set up an Amiga and PC in the EA offices ready to show the exec. We were proud of the progress we had made and excited to show him each game. We were even hoping that we would leave with a publishing contract. The VP burst into the room and I offered to shake his hand as I introduced myself. Don't bother telling me your names as I won't remember them, he snorted. He walked over to Halloween Harry that was running on a PC. This is the wrong game for the PC, arcade games don't sell, he informed me. Then he moved to the Amiga where Amazon Queen was running. And this is on the wrong platform, this should be on a PC. Then he began a tirade about how terrible each of our games were, how an adventure game from anybody but Lucasfilm would have to be 100 times better than theirs to even stand a chance of success. He spent over 10 minutes being the most arrogant and rude person he could. Then he left. I was in shock. I looked over at the Australian staff who had witnessed the entire ordeal. They shrugged and the local manager said, well, I guess that's it then. We picked up our machines in silence, and as we walked out the door I said, thanks. Thanks for nothing. When I got home to Brisbane I was so mad and so determined to prove the exec wrong that I rifled through every PC and Amiga Games magazine I had and compiled a list of every publisher I could find. Over the next week I duplicated multiple floppy disk copies of Amazon Queen, printed covering letters and mailed them overseas. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 30. Over the next few weeks I waited by the fax machine for possible replies from publishers. To my relief I began to get replies. A number of publishers had received the floppy disks, played the game and liked it. Things began to progress rather quickly as these new publishers began to talk about contracts and publishing terms. I was so happy our game was going to be published. Then, an amazing thing happened. I received a phone call from the UK. This is Eric Matthews from the Bitmap Brothers, said the voice on the other end. I was in awe. The Bitmap Brothers were the coolest game developers around responsible for Xenon, Speedball, Magic Pockets, Gods and the Chaos Engine. They were video game rock stars. And they liked our game. The Bitmap Brothers had created a new games publisher called Renegade Software with music label Rhythm King. This new publisher offered creative control, amazing royalties and best of all, the opportunity to work with amazingly talented people. Steve and I signed with them immediately then flew over to Chicago for the summer CES of 1993 to meet with Eric and his team. After that we arranged to spend four months in the UK to finish the game and record the voices. Tony Ball had joined our team full-time to help finish the PC version, and he joined Steve and I in the UK. The feedback from Eric and our producer Graham Boxall was great, and the entire Renegade team including General Manager Dan Thompson, Marketing Director Tom Watson and Office Manager Abby Haynes did all they could to support the game. One of their suggestions was to add a new sequence to the beginning of the game to introduce the characters, set up the story and extend the playtime. We figured a prelude similar to the Indiana Jones movies would make perfect sense so we started at the end of a previous adventure. This gave us an opportunity to incorporate a new character into the game, Mike Laris, a sniveling bellboy inspired by the obnoxious EA executive who was incredibly rude to us. The hotel bellboy's dialogue revolves around his uncle EA. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 31. Published at last After a lot of hard work we finally completed Flight of the Amazon Queen. 
It was published in the UK and Europe in 1995. Initially, the sales weren't good and I was convinced that it was a flop. My diary entry of August 17, 1995 reads, Well, Amazon Queen has been released. It's flopped in the UK but may break even in the rest of the world. Whatever, we won't make any royalties. Oh well, at least it's over. To make matters worse, Warner Interactive acquired Renegade, and then ignored the creative approval that Renegade had given developers. They launched the game in the US with this awful cover. Steve and I couldn't believe it. After all of our hard work they quietly shipped the game out to the US market with a cover featuring pygmies, not in our game, a cobra, not found in South America, and Joe King drawn from what looks like a stock baseball pose. It was embarrassing. But it wasn't all bad news. My diary update on the 15th of June, 1996 reads, ignore the previous page's remarks about Amazon Queen not making royalties. We actually made over $30,000 so far, with perhaps more to come. And more did come. It kept us in business until 1999 when we became Chrome Studios and began a massive growth spurt, producing numerous console games. But that is a story for another day. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 32. Other Platforms We explored the ideas of adapting Amazon Queen to the Game Boy. I am a huge Nintendo fan and the challenge of recreating the game on a handheld was exciting. Steve mocked up these images to show how we could have adapted the core gameplay and story to the original Game Boy system. Players moved Joe with the D-pad and used Select to open the inventory screen to equip items to the A or B buttons. Press A to talk to a character with an option to give them an inventory item. Sadly the project didn't get any traction. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 33. Press Reception Flight of the Amazon Queen got great coverage in the UK thanks to Renegade's awesome marketing department. We even managed to get on the cover of a few magazines. We even created an interactive interview using the game engine that came on the cover disc of some magazines. Readers could play the role of a magazine journalist and visit us on the set of Flight of the Amazon Queen to ask us questions about the game, after solving a few adventure game puzzles of course. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 34. The Legacy I'm proud of what we achieved with Flight of the Amazon Queen and that it has managed to stick around since its original publication in 1993. In 2000 for the Scum VM team contacted me about adapting the game for their emulator. I was worried that the game might be lost forever in the mists of times now that it was no longer available to buy, so I gave them my blessing to adapt it. The game was released free with Scum VM and was introduced to a new audience of adventure players. In 2009, after the iPhone became a valid games platform, IPH Soft contacted me about creating an iOS version. I thought this was a great idea to introduce it to even more people, so I licensed them the rights for mobile. Now, GOG.com has released the game introducing it to an even newer generation of players. It's humbling to think that a game I made over 20 years ago has stood the test of time and is still playable in the 21st century. The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen 35. About the author John Passfield has been making games since he was in high school. He published his first game, Chilly Willy, in 1984 and followed this up with Halloween Harry in 1985. Both games were made on the Australian-developed Microbe computer. After graduating with a computer science degree John worked for a telecommunications company as a programmer only to have this job suck the joy of computers out of him. He quit and began to write and draw comics with his good friend Peter Mullins, before meeting Steve Stamatiades and having his love of games and computers rekindled. He funded his newfound lifestyle of making computer games by writing Dingo Boy and Vixen Rangers for a national men's magazine. After making the new Halloween Harry and Flight of the Amazon Queen, 
John co-founded Chrome Studios and went on to create TY the Tasmanian Tiger and other games. Chrome grew to 140 employees before John sold out of the company and took Halloween Harry, Amazon Queen, and other game IP with him. He worked at Pandemic Studios and co-owned Three Blokes Studios before selling it to Rock U. John now owns Red Sprite Studios and runs Right Pedal Studios, a mobile games accelerator that helps indie developers get their games to market. John lives in Brisbane, Australia with his wife Lee and their children Ella and Zach. The author as a sprite set is featured in the Amazon Queen Interactive Interview. Passfieldgames.com at John Passfield. Copyright Copyright 2013 John Passfield.
The Making of Flight of the Amazon Queen The 20th Anniversary Edition If you had asked me 20 years ago, will people still be playing your game in 20 years' time? I would have replied will people even remember my game in 20 years' time? That was the nature of games back then, technology moved so fast that games became outdated and abandoned. But one thing I didn't count on was the amazing power of the internet and the incredible reach of mobile devices. Mojo Touch reached out to me about bringing Amazon Queen to the iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch and now, for the 20th anniversary, to Android devices. Thanks to Mojo Touch and fans from around the world, Flight of the Amazon Queen has lived on on brand new platforms for new, and old, fans to enjoy. They have done an amazing job in adapting a point-and-click interface designed for mouse and PC to work intuitively with touchscreen devices. The new interface from Mojo Touch. It's humbling to think that a game I made over 20 years ago has stood the test of time and is still playable today in the 21st century.